The Nature Conservancy is to work with scientists and ecologists um, from universities and research agencies and uh, the Nature Conservancy and uh, beyond uh, to do uh, ecology, uh, particularly in the tall grass prairie uh, where we do a lot of ecological restoration, rebuilding that. By training, uh, I am a soil ecologist. Uh, my expertise is actually on all of the wildlife that lives under the ground. And so today I'm here to actually share with you about uh, soil biodiversity and the life beneath our feet. Uh, I'm also going to say throughout this talk, I, I try to do this in a bit of an interactive way. So for those of you in classrooms or at home, um, if one person could be by a keyboard to be able to type uh, back some responses, that'll help uh, this feel a little bit more like a discussion um, so I can kind of respond to questions that you all might have um, and also so that you can uh, uh, provide some input. I'm going to ask a few questions myself uh, throughout the presentation. Um, and I would also say, as you have questions, um, feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat box, and I'll um, kind of pick some opportune moments uh, to, to catch up on those um, as we progress through. Uh, so my hope is we can spend time talking about the stuff you all are excited or interested in and uh, make this really useful to you all. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know everyone probably has a limited time window here. So when I say the word dirt, what do you all think of? What are some of the uh, words or definitions that come to mind when you say dirt? And go ahead and uh, type those into the chat response if you can. Mud, okay, I see mud, worms, that's a good one. Brown, most dirt is brown. Soil, that's a good one. Displaced soil, sand, that's good. Tardigrades, somebody is way ahead of me on this one. Microorganisms, uh, this is great. You guys are already thinking a lot about the things that live in dirt. Now, if I said the word uh, soil, what does that bring to mind? Does that bring the same kind of words to mind or different words? Smelly. Okay. Plants, plants, plant food. Yeah. Fertilizer, dirt. Yeah. Moist, okay. A more specific science description, okay, great, great. Yeah, so these are really great, and, and you all are actually really hitting in on um, some of the key characteristics here. So uh, dirt is, is a word that we all use a lot, and we generally mean that, you know, that brown stuff outside. Um, and soil often feels like a more precise uh, term, and it is. And um, if you go into the dictionary, one of the key differences between the definition for dirt and the definition for soil is that soil is able to, um, it's, it's an area that plants can grow in. So several of you mentioned plants with soil, and that's, that's great. Um, soil can support plant growth. Soil can support life below ground. Um, it includes all the microbes and tardigrades and invertebrates that, that live in the, in the soil. And dirt, as a term, more precisely, um, means kind of just the uh, what we might call inorganic or abiotic. It's just kind of the sand and the uh, clay and those components. Um, and it often has a connotation of, uh, you know, when something's dirty, like you want to clean it off, it, you know, that sort of thing. And so the really critical difference is life. Um, soil supports life. Soil is home to life. Um, in fact, soil is home to almost 30% of all biodiversity on Earth lives in the soil. Um, it's one of the most diverse habitats uh, on our planet, and yet we know so little about it. Um, so I guess I just talked about that. My apologies. <laughs> we'll keep moving. So um, this is uh, just a sampling of some of the myriad of organisms that live 
in soil. Um, it represents almost all of the animal taxa um, and plant taxa as well, um, as well as um, our bacteria and uh, protists and, and all of those fun things as well. So we have everything, um, we have a lot of representation in diversity in soil. And um, to kind of dive into this topic and hopefully do it in a way that's a little bit more of a conversation, um, I'm going to actually uh, highlight for you all uh, a publication that uh, I was involved helping um, helping with. So uh, before I took this job with the Nature Conservancy, I worked with an organization called the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, and that's based at Colorado State uh, University. And this organization, um, along with the European uh, Union uh, Research Center, actually put together this atlas. It's a large book. In fact, let me pull it down and show you all. Um, it's, it's a big coffee table book, about 170 pages. And uh, this book highlights all of the uh, diversity of soil and what we know about it so far, uh, which turns out we know a lot, but there's a lot we don't know as well. So for today, I'm actually going to spend a lot of time showing you the website that my colleagues and I have put together uh, to share this information. And any of you can visit this website and look at this information in more detail or download um, all or parts of this atlas. Um, this is a great resource if you have to write, uh, maybe write an essay for a class or you just want to know more about it. Um, this is a really great resource. It, uh, over 150 different scientists contributed to writing this um, book and so it's got kind of the latest and greatest knowledge um, from soil biodiversity world. You can also order a print copy of this book. Um, the the EU uh, Research Center did the printing of it, and we and it sold at cost. So unfortunately for those in uh, North America, you do have to pay shipping from Europe, which can be a little pricey. But even including shipping, the cost of one of these books is about $40, depending on where you live. So if you're a teacher and you can and you want to order one for your classroom, um, you can do that um, online. Um, and the links are, are here on the slide, but I can also share those with you if you want them otherwise. So to actually dive into this book and show it to you, I'm going to switch into a screen sharing mode. Um, and we're all going to just look at the website together. Um, here we go. Great. So uh, I've gone ahead. This is uh, the Atlas website. And I've gone ahead and I've navigated us to the chapter about the diversity of soil organisms. Um, and so you'll see here we've kind of given a brief um, overview of how soil is a really diverse habitat. Most of the, uh, there's a lot of biota uh, represented in it and why that's so important to us. And then here you can download um, just that chapter. We have both a high resolution and a low resolution, um, depending on your internet speed, you can, you can download either one of those. And then as we scroll down here, we can actually explore these individual taxa uh, in more detail. So I'm going to toss this back to you all and ask, um, are there any um, organisms up here on the screen um, that uh, seem particularly exciting? Um, what do you want to know more about? Lichens. All right. Well, let's take a look at lichens, and um, everybody else keep typing in suggestions because we'll come back to some other uh, uh, organisms here. So, um, as it says here, lichens are uh, actually not a single organism. This is a great one to start with because there's so much cool stuff to talk about with lichens. So, lichens are actually uh, we call it a, a symbiotic. Um, relationship. And so this is uh, a case where a fungus and one or two uh, bacteria or green algae um, kind of create uh, an individual multicellular uh, uh, appearing type organism. So have um, 
you guys don't have to type this back in the chat, but but have people ever heard that word symbiosis or talked about that in biology class? Um, that's a um, it's a super cool, super cool thing. So essentially the bacteria or the algae lives in the fungal um, cell structure and then they can um, photosynthesize or, or uh, access energy by sunlight or breaking down rock material and then the fungus can, can grow from that. So this is a really cool thing. It looks like a single organism, but it's actually a whole complex community um, of organisms. So this is, lichen is a little bit of a, three for one deal on, on organisms. And we see lichen everywhere, growing on tree logs, on rocks, um, even on the soil surface itself. It's, one, it's a great one to go to the woods and look up up close. So I see a bunch of other suggestions. Um, I guess before I toggle back here, so if you're interested in learning more about lichens, um, we have a whole um, page about lichens from the atlas and this will get into even more detail where it'll describe how that um, symbiosis uh, works, um, how we classify or describe fungi, where they live, um, it'll talk about their diversity, about 28,000 different species of lichen described around the world, 28,000, that's a lot, um, and some really awesome pictures of various lichens um, from around the world. Um, so anyway, if you want to know more information, you can find it there. Um, so I'm going to toggle us back to our menu. I see um, a class is starting a microscope unit. That's awesome. So uh, anything like protists or algae, um, that is a great idea. So um, I'm actually, all right, let's look at protists. And then I'm actually going to show you rotor first, too. That's a great one to look at under the microscope. Um, so protists are, uh, I don't know, maybe you've heard about protists in your biology classes. Uh, these are single-celled organisms, but they're not bacteria. So um, bacteria uh, don't have a nucleus, and things called eukaryotes do have a nucleus. And uh, most living things, including us, are eukaryotes. Uh, and protists are eukaryotes, but protists only have, um, their bodies are only a single cell. Um, and that's different from what we think about with like plants and animals, uh, where we're made up of lots of different cells. Protists, it's one cell is the whole organism, and that's similar to bacteria. Bacteria are single celled as well. Um, what's super cool about protists, uh, there's lots of cool things about protists, but one of the coolest things about protists is they often live in these colonies with lots of cells. And so each of these cells is an individual, but they live in a colony together, and they can often resemble um, what we might think is a multicellular organism. So slime molds are a really great example of this. And slime molds are also a super cool thing. Uh, most of you can probably go to the woods uh, in warmer weather and uh, find slime molds. And uh, sometimes there's a certain kind of slime mold that uh, actually looks like um, uh, vomit. Let me see if I can pull a picture of that one up. Um, and we call it the dog vomit uh, slime mold. Here we go. Uh, and this is a real thing. Uh, <laughs> it's a real organism, and what's so cool is these are actually uh, probably millions of, of individuals that just appear as a multicellular organism. There's also a ton of protists that really do only live as a single cell, and um, a lot of these we don't know much about. Um, and so this is a really cool emerging area of research, and I have some colleagues that are doing a lot of cool uh, protist research, um, and it's just fun about once every month or two uh, to check in and see what they've discovered uh, recently. So we're learning a lot more about the kinds of organi organisms that are protists and what they do in ecosystems and, and how important they are. Amoebas are another type of protist. Uh, some people may have heard of those. Uh, there's a couple of sci-fi movies that actually took some inspiration from the amoeba, amoeba life form. Okay, um, protists. Uh, let's look at rotifers. That's another good microscope. And then I see somebody else wanted to look at some glow-in-the-dark mushrooms. Uh, we'll definitely backtrack to that. You may notice there's more organisms that I haven't gotten to because it's a slow scrolling screen. So um, as a preview, 
think about some of these uh, larger organisms as well as we and we can check some of these out so rotifer i'm going to do it this way um, these are microscopic animals this is a really big image <laughs> sorry that's not going to work very well on your screens um, and they have these cool little crowns on the top of their body that have these little, uh, they're called cilia, and they kind of beat, and that's how they move around. So they're really cool to look out under the microscope because they're moving around and they've got these kind of swirling, vibrating uh, crowns um, on them. Uh, and, they run, and they move through water films. So uh, moist soil or pond water, um, you'll, you'll probably be able to find some rotifers. And um, they're super cool because they, they're usually one of the bigger things that you'll see under a microscope. Uh, and they'll often come uh, uh, swarming through or, or swimming through your slide uh, and you'll be like wait what's that uh, so uh, check out some rotifers um, and like I said uh, you can um, learn a lot more information about um, rotifers uh, in uh, the atlas section here if you want to dive into that um, all right so let's look at some glow-in-the-dark fungi and like I said if you see something else on the screen that um, looks exciting go ahead and type it in the uh, in the comment section and we'll try and capture some of these uh, other uh, really cool organisms as well all right so uh, this section is about fungi in general but there are glow-in-the-dark fungi um, these particular, this picture, these particular fungi are found in, I believe, Indonesia in the Pacific Southwest. Uh, so they're, uh, depending on where you live, there may or may not be glow-in-the-dark fungi in your uh, local natural area. But um, this is uh, one uh, one type of fungi and one type of reactions. Um, fungi in general are actually super important um, because they play a really important role in breaking down uh, dead dead things, particularly dead wood. Uh, so there are certain types of fungi that um, can break down components of wood that uh, no other organism on Earth can do. And so that's uh, a really cool function they have. There's also a lot of fungi that uh, create these uh, another symbiotic relationship uh, with plants where the fungus actually lives in the plant root and extends out into the soil and, and they're able to use energy that the plant um, produces through photosynthesis um, and then the fungus can absorb more nutrients from the soil, things like nitrogen or phosphorus, and transport that to the plant. So the plant gives up some of its energy from photosynthesis in return for these nutrients um, and the fungus uh, can get an energy source um, in, in uh, exchange for some of these nutrients that it's pretty good at uh, finding. So it's a cool example of teamwork uh, in the natural world. Um, and these glow-in-the-dark fungi are um, basically creating a compound um, in, their, in their bodies uh, that uh, react to create this glowing light um, at night uh, and there's there's actually several cool varieties of that so hopefully that that touches in on fungi um, all right I see some additional um, thoughts uh, my bad team um, I just realized I, <laughs> I didn't navigate this particularly well I'm sorry uh, hopefully I'm not making anybody dizzy <laughs> Okay, uh, pseudoscorpions, that is a great one to take a look at. Um, so the pseudoscorpions uh, are, are actually, they're very small. They're arachnids, so they're related to spiders. They are not actually related to scorpions at all. They just happen to look a little bit like a scorpion. Um, and you can find pseudoscorpions um, if you look closely enough. Sometimes having a, a magnifying glass can help you uh, see them. Uh, we've found some of these. I work in Illinois. We found some of these um, out in our um, field site uh, last summer. So they're around. Uh, you just have to look really carefully to see them. But um, they're called pseudoscorpions because they have these big pinchers uh, in front of their uh, of their bodies that they use to uh, uh, 
grab prey. So these are predators and they're picking up even smaller little insects or invertebrates. So some of the things like nematodes or tardigrades, uh, the pseudoscorpions are really good at, at grabbing onto those and eating them. Um, they also will do ants and mites and larvae and that sort of thing. So they're actually kind of a, a top predator in the soil in, in many ways, uh, but they're super cool looking. Um, I recommend checking them out. All right, somebody else suggested tardigrades, and, and that came up in the beginning, so we should definitely uh, loop over here into tardigrades. They're up here. So tardigrades are uh, a really cool microscopic organism. Um, you might be able to see some of these under a microscope. Um, sometimes it's helpful um, if you've taken a soil sample, you might need to um, do a little filtering or to spin them down to get a really good look at the tardigrades. And actually the Atlas has a little fun at home um, prescription for how to uh, extract some tardigrades or nematodes out of soil to look at more closely. Uh, sometimes these guys are called water bears or moss piglets. Um, they're incredibly adorable. Uh, this is what we like to call charismatic microfauna. So um, just cute things that, that people, including myself, get really excited about. Uh, tardigrades are actually super cool in their own right. Um, they're really tough organisms. They're able to really handle a wide extreme of conditions. Um, they can remain frozen in um, you know, freezing conditions for years at a time. They're able to produce actually um, a little bit of an antifreeze compound in their body that keeps them alive. Um, and they can uh, withstand extreme drought. They can kind of go into a, um, uh, a resting phase where they're maybe not actively eating and moving, but they can withstand drought until the rains come again and, and they can rehydrate. Uh, and they've even sent tardigrades to space on the spaceship uh, to uh, investigate how they uh, function in space. So there's tardigrades that have gone to space and come back to Earth and live to tell the tale. So that's super cool too. All right. Um, what else did we have? Akari. That is a really good one uh, because we often don't know much about that. I got to find where it is on, on here. It's probably, here we go. I'm staring right at it. Um, Akari. So uh, we've labeled it Akari here on the website because that's a pretty broad term. These are mites mites. Uh, so this, uh, which you may have heard of it, this also, this group also includes ticks. Uh, so uh, these are actually super common. Um, many of you, I'm sure, probably have run into ticks before. You've probably run into mites as well, but they're a little less noticeable. Uh, they don't uh, burrow into our skin and give us diseases in the same way. Um, they can uh, sometimes account, it says here, up to 40% of all soil microarthropods, so they're actually a really big part of soil communities in a lot of places, and um, they can feed on a wide variety of things. So there's a lot of mites that are actually predators, and they're eating things like ants and um, um, insects and larvae and that sort of thing, um, but then there's also mites that are eating mostly bacteria and fungi um, off of the soil or the soil surface. And so uh, these are really uh, important little organisms. They're also really important prey organisms for bigger things, um, bigger insects and, and sometimes even birds and, and other such things. So these are mites. Um, and then I see a, a request for beetles. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit to give you guys because there's more organisms here. <laughs> um, and let's take a look at our beetles here. So uh, beetles are, uh, scientifically, we consider them part of the group Coleoptera, or they are the group Coleoptera. Um, and this is one of the largest and most diverse orders of animals um, in the world. So it says here there's over 370,000 described species of beetles. Uh, so there's a lot of them. And the tiger beetle, uh, which I see someone requested, uh, is, is one of those. Um, many um, beetles 
can fly around and live above ground, uh, but their larvae tend to develop below ground in the soil. And then there's also many beetles that uh, dig in the soil and, and live in the soil as well. So we think of like dung beetles, um, uh, grabbing bits of dung and rolling it into balls and burying it uh, where then they lay their eggs and their larvae uh, can, um, can use that as an energy source. So uh, where I work now at, at a grassland site, uh, we actually look at our dung beetle population a lot. Um, they are really important because they bring things like not only manure, but dead plants and, and debris, and they bury it in the soil. So it really helps with kind of turning over nutrients and soil and, and making those connect connections um, together. So beetles are super cool. They're also incredibly beautiful. Um, so I would say uh, definitely uh, look at the beetle fronts. Um, this is just a highlight of some of the really cool beetles uh, that we have out and about uh, in our world. All right, someone says the snake one. Um, all right, I'm going to ask a question because we do have uh, we do have some snakes. So our actual snakes are going to be in our megafauna section. So let me open that up. Uh, there's also a few things that you're looking at that might look like a snake that actually aren't a snake. Um, so if uh, you meant uh, something else, like just let me know and we can we can backtrack and look at something a little differently. So when we talk about megafauna, we're not talking about like elephants and giraffes and bison and that sort of thing. We're talking about um, small mammals, mice and voles, reptiles, amphibians, and snakes. Um, and so if we look at that in a little more detail, I'm trying to see if we have a good picture of a, of a snake in here, but it, we definitely do consider uh, most snakes do create burrows in the ground. Um, they can translocate um, stuff to these lower, uh, um, lower levels of the soil. So we have our mammals and our moles and our voles uh, up here. A naked mole rat. Um, these are actually um, amphibians, so um, this one here is a uh, Cecilian, Cecilian. Um, they are an amphibian, they're related to, um, they're related to salamanders, but they don't have legs, so they look a lot like a snake or a earthworm, but they're, they're not, um, <laughs> they're, they're actually a vertebrate. Um, and then these are, these are called worm lizards. Um, and you can see they do have a little leg there, but um, they're, they are lizards. Um, they, they look like worms, but they're not. Uh, soil is full of things that look like what you think they might be, but they're not. All right. I don't think we have a good picture of a snake, but we do have some, some cool other things going on here. So, um, all right. The Myriapoda. Okay. That's what I, I wondered if that's what it was. This is, all right. The Myriapoda. Okay, that's what I, I wondered if that's what it was. This is actually a millipede. So let's take a look at this in, um, in more detail. So the Myriapoda, this includes centipedes uh, and millipedes, as well as several other organisms that uh, we don't think about a lot. And so I'm going to go ahead and open up this uh, PDF here because there's some better pictures of some of these. Um, so this includes some of these, these guys here, which are called, um, this is a parapoda and this is a symphala. Uh, these are related to centipedes and millipedes, but they in fact are uh, slightly different. So the miropoda includes all of these guys. And these again, often function as predators in the soil um, ecosystem. They're eating other uh, insects and invertebrates and um, they also do a lot to like shred leaf litter and that sort of thing. So we're often used to seeing centipedes and millipedes, um, sometimes in leaf litter, um, if you're out for the walk, a walk in the woods or the park. Uh, sometimes we see them in our houses. Um, they're, they're really harmless to people. Uh, they really are. Uh, in the tropics, there are some types of uh, uh, millipedes and centipedes that can actually eat bigger things like a bird or a uh, um, even a small uh, mammal or something of that sort, but uh, those are pretty rare. We don't, um, 
it it would be cool to see one of those, uh, but uh, they're they're not super common. So most of these, they uh, the centipedes and millipedes, they they do actually produce a little bit of toxin to help them um, hurt their prey, but um, that would never ever hurt a human. It's it's a very very small amount, um, and it's only dangerous if you're something like an ant. So cool. All right. Um, is there anything else that people want to talk about uh, before we move on to something else? Coleoptera. Yes, those were the beetles, actually. Um, yeah, the beetles are the coleoptera. I'm realizing now, <laughs> I, I, I confess, I actually built this website, and I'm realizing I should have maybe used better words here, um, but these are the beetles. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's these are the words that, that scientists use to describe these organisms, and it just helps us uh, hone in on a little more uh, precise of a definition. Um, so I know sometimes it's annoying, uh, those big fancy words, but it just helps us know um, what exactly we're talking about. So yeah, so somebody's asking about the jumping worms, and that's a really great question. Um, and I'm going to not, uh, hopefully not make you too dizzy. I'm going to just leave this up and uh, let people think about that. But that would be in our earthworm category. And the jumping worms um, in North America, they're actually an invasive species. They come originally from um, parts of Asia. And um, I, believe, I'm trying, I believe they're known as jumping worms um, because uh, they... Um, like we're used to worms when it gets wet, they like kind of crawl up to the surface. But I think the jumping worms actually have a do, do a bit of a jumping action. But um, they're actually in an, an invasive species here in North America. And I know um, I'm thinking particularly along like the east coast and the southeast. Um, it's actually an organism that uh, people worry about that that there's some active measures to try and control it a little bit. The trick. Um, to be honest, in North America, we have a lot of invasive earthworms. Um, the glaciers about 10,000 years ago knocked out most of the native earthworms in kind of the north and northeast part of North America. Um, native earthworms continued to persist and still thrive in kind of the southeast and across the southern portion of, of North America, um, but kind of from like a line from like Iowa, Illinois, Indiana on southward, we had native earthworms. On northward, most of those native earthworms were knocked out by the glaciers, and so um, a lot of our earthworms that we see in those parts are, are, in, are actually invasive. They're European or Asian earthworms that have come over at various points um, with people, um, and uh, they are actually really changing how uh, ecosystems work. They eat a lot of litter. They turn that litter over much faster. Um, and this isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. Um, it's just a different thing. And so um, the jumping worms are one of those um, invasive earthworm species uh, that can have a really big impact. Um, they can also exclude uh, other native species um, and cause some major changes that way. All right, um, ground-dwelling macrofauna. That's the slug, I love this picture, <laughs> the slug, the snail, and the mushroom. Um, we've kind of got all of our bases covered in that picture. Uh, so yeah, so we talk about uh, ground-dwelling uh, macrofauna. These are things that typically they live directly on the soil surface. They may not actually burrow down into the soil very much, um, but this includes things like um, slugs, it includes snails. Here's a nice banana slug picture. Um, I hope I'm not making you all too dizzy with uh, clicking around this website. Uh, spiders, it's a nice little spider there. Uh, true scorpions, a true scorpion. Um, and um, bees, we have a lot of ground nesting bees that, that are important in soil. Um, I'm trying to think what else do we put on ground dwelling macrofauna. Um, yeah, bees, slugs, snails, spiders, scorpions, um, some of the beetles kind of fall in this category too. Uh, 
So these are often kind of the creepy crawlies that you could see without a microscope um, out in the woods. And they play a really important role in um, decomposing that litter material. So without these folks, um, we'd have dead leaves and logs probably up to our shoulders and in the woods. And so they, they play a really important role in all of that. And some of these are predators as well, eating other insects um, and smaller animals. Um, all right. Praying mantis would be a great insect. I would probably classify it also as a, as a ground-dwelling uh, macrofauna uh, in that category. All right, um, let's talk about some larvae and some ants uh, and see where we are with time after that. So, um, So the larvae, these includes uh, many, many types of insects um, that uh, they actually lay their eggs in the soil and the insects develop in the soil. So this in can include um, beetles. This can also include uh, cicadas. So we often think about those like 17-year cicadas that emerge periodically. Um, those, they emerge every 17 years because that's how long it takes their larvae to develop below ground in the soil. So those larvae are spending 17 years underground eating roots, um, growing. Um, they go through several, uh, they're called instars, but several kind of metamorphosis phases before they emerge as adult cicadas. And so um, after a kind of a 17 year growth phase below ground, they all emerge uh, for a summer and uh, chirp and uh, have a big kind of mating event, um, lay their eggs in the soil, and then those eggs uh, take uh, a, another 17 years to develop. So yeah, who knew? An insect, 17 year life cycle. Uh, we also see a lot of things like flies and moths uh, that lay their, their things below the ground. Let's see if there's some pictures um, of some of these. A lot of the larvae kind of look gross when we see them. So here we have, here's some little uh, larvae living on a root. So you see how they can infect the root or, or actually eat the root itself. Here's kind of what we might call a grub, kind of the standard um, insect larvae. Um, all right, there's larvae in this picture. I'm not sure, oh, here, here they are, here's the larvae. So those kind of things like uh, mealworms or something like that are often um, larvae. This is actually a cicada larvae here, a nymph. Um, and then we've got uh, just some other examples here. Oh yeah, this is this is kind of cool. This is a larvae that sends like a little um, snorkel up to the surface um, during part of its development, and then the the full adult emerges through that. Um, so that's a uh, that's a popular um, cordyceps. It's it's uh, it's a, it's a larvae that gets infected by a fungus, and it's a it's a cool system. Cool. Um, all right. Let's look at ants, and then I'm going to pop back um, to the PowerPoint and kind of give some more open question time. So um, ants um, are, again, a very big, diverse group of organisms. Ants are super cool because they're something that we call eusocial or social insect. And so they tend to live in colonies. And there are certain jobs um, that different uh, members of the colony do. Uh, they're actually really important for soil all around the world. Um, and they're particularly important in tropical areas. Um, they can harvest um, leaf litter. Um, like our, um, what do they call them, the leaf cutter ants that then take the leaf litter below ground and they actually grow fungal farms that the fungi are decomposing the leaf litter and then the ants are actually feeding on the fungi. So it's this whole cool uh, system uh, that the ants put together. Um, these ants here are actually tending aphids um, and they're using the aphids as their protein source, as their food source. So ants are very industrious. Um, they often, they can eat other insects. They prey on other insects. Um, and in general, we consider them to be omnivores. So. 
Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to toggle us back to the PowerPoint, but um, this website is out there. There's lots of information, um, and everyone should feel free to, to look into it um, if they want to know more or look at a topic we didn't um, have time to uh, explore today. So, um, more of that. Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and take some time to let you all, if you all have questions for me, to go ahead and ask those. Um, and it's also uh, okay if you have questions about kind of what my day-to-day -day job as a scientist is like too. I have, a, I have a couple of photos I can share about that as well. Yeah, what do you do in the winter when the soil is frozen? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, like today. <laughs> um, so actually in the winter time, I'm doing a lot of data analysis and writing. Um, so the information that I collect during uh, the summertime and the growing season, I take time to look at it and uh, do statistical analyses to actually understand um, how those organisms are interacting, and then and then I write papers about it um, to share with other scientists. Um, I um, also um, do some lab work in the winter time. So I actually personally do a lot of work with some microorganisms. I just realized we didn't talk about our microbes very much, our uh, bacteria and fungi, which is fine. Um, and a lot of that requires some specific work laboratory work um, like DNA analysis or um, nutrient analysis and, and I do a lot of that in the winter time too. So I'm doing more inside work um, but still uh, moving that science forward. Uh, there's another question about where am I currently working and uh, that's a great question because I just recently changed uh, jobs and so I'm kind of kind of still straddle on the fence in that respect. I currently work with the Nature Conservancy, uh, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting um, na nature in uh, natural areas. And uh, my role is more as an ecologist in general, so I still do a lot of soil work, but I work with a lot of um, ecologists that uh, work with uh, other organisms like birds and bison and plants and all of that as well. Uh, so I actually work in Illinois uh, at a preserve called Nechisa Grasslands. Um, our preserve is about 3,500 acres uh, restored tall grass prairie. So we do a lot of planting tall grass prairie um, and uh, working to, to restore that. So in the wintertime here, I have a little bit of work that I do have to go outside um, and do that's not directly related to the soil work, but, but more to science and management here. Uh, what does a day in your life look like? Um, as you're probably gaining, uh, getting a sense of, uh, it kind of depends on what time of year it is. Uh, during the summertime, when it's active field season, sometimes I'm out in the field from sunup to sundown, um, collecting soil, um, sorting soil, collecting data, that sort of thing. So I'm also keeping track of what plants I see, what animals I see. Um, some days I'm um, doing lab analyses, some days I'm doing statistical analyses, some days I'm writing papers, some days I get to talk to people like you, uh, which are, is really fun uh, to get to share uh, the work I do uh, and the work that my, my colleagues do. I do travel some, I get to go to meetings and conferences with other scientists um, actually around the world, uh, so that's really fun to get to go share about soil organisms and learn about soil organisms in other parts of the world. Um, I was at a meeting and met a scientist from Japan who have, uh, like we have periodic cicadas, they have these periodic millipedes that like emerge every eight years and uh, wreak havoc on traffic uh, in Japan. Um, so yeah, it kind of just depends on what day. So some days I'm sitting at a computer most of the day, some days I'm outside most of the day. Most days it's a little bit of both. Um, and some days I'm traveling, so yeah. 
Um, are there any endangered insects that live in soil? That is a really excellent question. Um, there are some. Um, there, uh, I, I have some colleagues that have been writing some papers about this, in fact. Um, Soil organisms aren't very well represented uh, with our kind of lists of endangered or animals of conservation concern. And part of that's because we don't know much about soil organisms, and part of that's because it's hard to have, um, to, to officially have an endangered organism, you have to have a lot of data about their population their populations or communities, and, and we lack that. There are some, so I'm thinking of, um, there's some endangered bees and some endangered millipedes that do have uh, life cycles below ground um, that would be considered soil organisms. Um, there may, in fact, be one or two endangered fungi um, on the list, but, but there's not many on the list, and that doesn't necessarily mean there's not organisms and soil that are rare or deserving of protection, it mostly just means um, we don't know much about them and we have more uh, information to collect. Uh, what's the most interesting organism uh, in your opinion? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and it's great because it's a little different than like what's my favorite. What's the most interesting? You know, I find I find a lot of the fungi to be particularly interesting, and part of it's because the fungi have a lot of these symbiotic relationships where they're interacting with another organism really um, in, in a really involved way, a really direct sort of way. Um, and in a lot of cases, like if you take the fungal partner away, that plant or um, sometimes even you know an invertebrate don't live or don't live very well without the fungal partner. The fungi also kind of produce these super highways below ground because the fungal mycelia kind of produce these, these long um, integrated networks and so they can connect different plants to each other and transfer nutrients and energy kind of along these fungal super highways. Um, and then the fungi themselves are all kind of competing and interacting with each other. Um, and it just like it just is mind-boggling every time I get to read about fungi. I think um, so much depends on fungi, uh, and and they don't quite get the cute rep that that a lot of other organisms do. Um, so another question of have you studied soils outside the contiguous U.S.? Um, that's a good question. I have been involved in some research projects um, beyond the U.S. Um, one of them. I did not get to go collect the soils, but um, we worked with some partners in South Africa to look at uh, soil uh, microbial communities in grassland restorations there. So uh, South Africa has some really cool examples of restored grasslands uh, that are actually very similar to some of the restored grasslands we have here in North America. And so we partnered uh, with some folks in um, uh, collected soil, and, and um, I got to do some laboratory analysis on that soil. Um, so that was really cool. It would have been cooler if I'd actually gotten to go there, but <laughs> it was cool to work on that. Um, I have, I'm trying to think here, what else have I done outside the U.S.? Um, I've worked on some projects with people outside the U.S., um, and again, these are situations where They've had data, and I've had data, and we've worked together to put our data together to, to understand something more about an ecosystem. I've been part of a group that's been working to um, map earthworms across the world, and that's some work that uh, we're getting very close to um, publishing and sharing with the world. So maybe, I don't know, maybe next year I'll be able to talk about our earthworm map. Uh, we're still kind of, it's been a lot of work to get that ironed out, but that's been fun. I've worked with uh, scientists from Brazil and Germany and the UK and um, Australia uh, and other uh, parts of the world, China, um, and India to, to pull that together. So that's been really exciting. Um, another question, uh, do inorganic fertilizers harm the soil? That's a really good question. Um, and in a lot of ways, it has to do with, with how much you use. Um, inorganic fertilizers um, are 
pretty good at giving one type of uh, nutrient to a plant. And so when we think about a crop plant, um, things like corn need a lot of that. And so it's that's one way to get a lot of, um, of nutrients to a crop plant. Um, but it's also a form that tends to get um, washed away in, in water and dissolved, and it, it leaves the system a lot. So we know that um, if you add fertilizer in kind of really fairly modest amounts, pretty small amounts, so in an amount that's much smaller than what you might add in, say, a cornfield, but maybe something um, uh, a rancher might add to a pasture to increase forage quality or something like that. Um, those have some impact on microbial communities, but uh, not a dramatic in, impact. As we get to higher levels, we do see a response, and, and often that's complicated because there's other things also happening in the system, maybe uh, tillage or planting or um, you move from a system that has perennial plants that are in the ground all year round to a system that just has annual plants that are planted for a crop only a few months of the year. So we know that kind of all coupled together, those things reduce uh, soil biodiversity a lot. And the fertilizer is part of that, but it's not the whole story. Um, oh, the periodic millipedes in Japan. I'm so glad you asked about this. I've uh, <laughs> I've talked to several people who didn't have interest in that, and I've always wondered why. So they're actually called the train millipedes, and um, they, again, they just have a really long life cycle below ground. Their larvae take about seven years to develop, um, and then they all kind of emerge in mass. And there's so many of them that they, like, cover the train tracks, and uh, the Japanese trains have to like change their schedule. They can't send as many trains down the tracks because the tracks get real slippery with all these millipedes when they get run over by the train. Um, so yeah, so they just come out and they just cover everything. Lamp posts, street corners, it's just kind of sidewalks covered in millipedes and about every eight years this happens. Um, and I think uh, I, there is, um, uh, some colleagues of mine wrote a blog post about this several years ago, so if you do a Google search, you'll probably be able to find it. But uh, I think the last emergence would have been the fall of 2016, uh, so they are uh, now kind of three years into their cycle. So I guess um, five years from now, 2024 would be the next uh, opportunity for the periodic millipede emergence in Japan. But yeah, this particular species of millipede, uh, I think only lives in that part of Japan. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just a cool thing. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I'm recognizing uh, that uh, we're coming up. It's 2.52. We don't have that much more time. So um, if there's any last minute questions, go ahead and type them in. I'll maybe, since we did talk a little bit about my day-to-day -day life, I should have been paying a little more attention to this. Um, these are some pictures of me doing work. So during the growing season, I'm often in the field, and that includes things like taking, during the growing season, I'm often in the field, and that includes things like taking soil cores, um, identifying plants, um, and then here I have done some winter field work where I've had to go take cores in the winter wintertime, uh, so that's what we kind of look like um, having to do all those things. Um, sometimes we take a tractor out and sometimes we do it by hand. Um, this is what kind of the lab life looks like, so when it's cold or rainy and I'm inside um, sieving soil, um, doing laboratory analyses, um, pipetting, um, that sort of uh, fine chemistry. Um, those are all indoor activities that I have to do uh, to answer these questions. Um, and then the sharing part. So um, not only I write papers to share with other scientists, but I also um, write some things. I've done some blog posts. Sometimes I go to conferences and I give a talk. Um, I, give, I can give webinars like this. Uh, and it's a cool way to share uh, the work we do because the, the science is really exciting and um, it's, it's great to have an opportunity to share it with um, lots of folks, not just uh, other scientists. Um, and I don't know, I think soils are some of the coolest stuff uh, to explore, and we know so little about it. Uh, so I'm always excited to have an opportunity uh, to share that uh, more broadly. Um, 
And then this is just a little bit of my work more specifically at Nechusa. We do have a, uh, a herd of bison and we do a lot of prescribed fire. So I also spend a lot of time outside um, doing those kinds of activities as well, which aren't directly related to my soil work, um, but they're important for uh, the prairie ecosystem where I work. And um, I do a lot of research that looks at how things like grazing and fire uh, impact soil communities um, and nutrients. So. Cool. Well, if there's any last minute questions, let me know. Otherwise, I think uh, we're pretty close to time. Uh, and thanks so much for uh, letting me share with you all. I really enjoyed it.